we thought that we'd do this standing up. Because if we sit on those lovely comfy chairs, they get very, very comfy. Um, we're uh, Obviously this week there's a lot of uh, YouTube in our lives. Uh, ending with the YouTube Fan Fest on the weekend as we talked about this morning. Um, really thrilled that uh, this guy is here. Because uh, he's got a job that I think a lot of people would probably kill for. Please welcome uh, Tom Pickett, the Vice President of Content for YouTube. Hello. Welcome to Digital Matters. Thank you. So, so Tom, uh, Vice President of YouTube Content of YouTube, uh, what do you tell your mum that you do for a living? She has a hard time understanding what I do. Uh, so, uh, Vice President of Content. So, I'm responsible for uh, global partnerships, uh, content creator partnerships with media companies, music labels, music publishers, new media companies, uh, all the way down to the small creators. So, we have over one million partners on the platform uh, today. And uh, again, that stretches the gamut. And uh, uh, we have teams that are deployed around around the globe. We operate now in 62 markets uh, around the globe. So uh, that keeps us busy and we think a lot about how do we make sure we have the right media partnerships, how do we cultivate uh, an organic community of creators in each of those markets. Uh, so is so it predominantly creators or yeah. is it also other channels, media companies? Yeah, we, we have a tendency to call everybody a creator, uh, but we mean rights holders, anybody who's who has content that they want to share and upload to the platform. So people yeah. in the audience here, potentially yes. clients and what have you. Absolutely, I would say you know everybody's a potential client. Uh, the, the key thing about YouTube is that YouTube is open to anybody, right? We are an open platform. That's why we have a million plus <laughs> partners and uh, it's open to anybody who wants to distribute to the world. That's the key differentiator of YouTube. So I've got 63,000 subscribers to the FanFest channel, I'm your client. You are. That change it. Do you want to interview me? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so look, YouTube's nine years yeah. old uh, this year. So's Music Matters, and we've both witnessed hypergrowth. <laughs> maybe you, <laughs> maybe yours is in a uh, slightly different uh, hemisphere. What, 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 uh, what wh wh where's it come from? And, and, and I think most importantly for everyone here, where's it going? Where's it heading? Sure. So uh, YouTube is hitting their ninth birthday this year. I joined YouTube just after Google acquired YouTube back in the end of 2006, early 2007. So I have been along for the journey for the last seven years. Uh, and it's been an amazing journey because we launched in English. You know, th there was just an English site, Global. And from the beginning, YouTube, you know, just attracted uploaders from all over the world. And slowly but surely, we have launched now in 62 markets. So just on this trip, I, uh, I stopped by and uh, talked to some creators and uh, uh, media partners in, in Japan. We just launched in Thailand on Monday. So that was our 62nd market. And uh, I was absolutely amazed by the, uh, by the creators we have there. We have some channels in Thailand that already have over 2 million subscribers to their channels. And we haven't even launched monetization. We haven't launched our ad sales. We just are launching the, the partner program. So. Absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal growth. But overall, so we've grown very quickly. We have over a billion uh, users that come to the platform every month. Over 80% of those are from outside the United States. And uh, we're seeing tremendous traction here in the Asia Pacific. We're also seeing a lot of growth in Latin America. We're seeing growth in the Middle East, Russia. So if you think about the markets where we're seeing what I would call hyper growth, we're definitely seeing triple digit growth. You know. We are going to continue to look, in the United States is certainly going to look like a smaller and smaller portion of, uh, of, our, of our traffic over time. So it's critically important that we spend uh, a lot of time here. We have, a, uh, we have over 100 hours of content that's uploaded uh, every minute. That's another one of our fun stats, 100 hours every minute of every day. So there's a lot of content. But let me tell you a couple things that are driving some of the, some of the trends that we're seeing. Mobile penetration, certainly uh, leading here in, in Asia Pacific, is, uh, is fundamentally changing the way people are consuming YouTube. 40% uh, of our traffic is now mobile globally. 
But in Korea, we're already at 65%. In Japan, we're at 55%. Thailand is about one third of our viewership. Uh, but that dynamic is, uh, is changing. Mobile is definitely the first screen uh, that uh, particularly the younger generation is thinking about when they're, when they're thinking about consuming content. Uh, the other key trend, and really YouTube was built for this trend that the consumer is in control. And uh, this idea of being able to watch your content anywhere you want it, when you want it, uh, how you want it, on any device that you want, uh, that is critical to us. Uh, you know, this idea of programming slots is getting harder and harder for the younger generation. They expect programmed, personalized recommendations. And, uh, you know, some of the challenges that we have with that are, you know, traditional media has not typically distributed in a global fashion like that. And often it's country by country, device by device. And so we're trying to work through how do we, how do we help that, uh, that content really flow across the globe? because all the YouTube original content is definitely available globally uh, on every device, and that's what consumers are really looking for. Uh, the third trend, I hope many of you saw Alex's, uh, Alex's uh, presentation just a couple hours ago about fans, and I think the key differentiator on, on, on YouTube is this connection that we have between creators and fans. And so, you know, we love the idea of the fan fest that we're doing together. I think that until you actually see a fan fest, until you see the connection that's created between a, a creator on YouTube and their fan, you don't really appreciate the dynamic. Uh, you don't appreciate that connection that's being filled with that two-way dialogue. And I think as we think forward, developing fans around the globe, developing that personal connection, that two-way dialogue is going to drive the way content is consumed. And so somehow you have to figure out how to, how to engage with that. And last, uh, you know, we're seeing a tremendous appetite for Asian content uh, around the globe. Uh, in India, certainly we're seeing uh, Bollywood content uh, being produced, uploaded to the platform, uh, Indian television content being uploaded. We have catch-up TV there, and that is being consumed all over the, all over the globe. Uh, you guys have heard, you know, certainly K-pop and Psy and now, uh, you know, the, the export market for uh, K-pop is just tremendous. Anime content, gaming content. The idea is that this content will find a home around the globe. And, uh, and, and we're seeing tremendous traction with, uh, with content that's produced in this market. So you, t you talk about 80% 80, 80 of uh, views are coming outside of the States. Um, maybe this is a slightly naughty question. You don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but it, are your ad revenues following that split? So uh, what generally happens is, uh, is, is viewership comes very, very quickly, and then monetization follows. So uh, you know, I think the best way to think about that question is you have to look at the ad rates that come in each, each market, right? So you could look, look at television ad rates as a proxy. And certainly, we see a, a big spread in terms of what those rates look like market by market. Um, and one of the challenges that we've had, actually, in, in, in terms of is growing is that when you have your viewership growing at such a high rate, you ha actually have to s you know, create your advertising ability and, and, and your sales efforts. It's tremendously challenging just to keep up with that growth. And we've seen this in the US, and we're finally at the point where we're catching up with growth. And, uh, and we think we're in a position where we're starting to see those uh, advertising rates increase. That's a brilliant dodge of a question. <laughs> um, what, uh, wha how, how are you monetizing talent? What are the different ways you're doing it? Is it product placement? Is it is it brand partnerships? What, what are the things that, you, that, that your sales guys are getting up to? <coughs> One of the things that uh, we just launched, uh, we did a big event in the US uh, that we'll start to do in other markets as well. We just had this event called Brandcast. And we actually launched what we call Google Preferred. And it's a way that we are packaging up our top 1% of channels and top 5% of channels. Because what we hear from advertisers are they're just overwhelmed. There's so much content on YouTube they're basically saying, I, I don't know the good from the bad. I don't know how to think about it. And uh, so uh, we're, getting, we're seemingly getting good traction with this, uh, this new packaging effort uh, to, uh, to continue to command higher and higher rates. But in general, the, the core model is advertising, whether it comes from reserved ad sales or through our auction uh, products. Now, what creators can do is they can also work with advertisers. And we also have a partner sales effort, which allows 
uh, partners to also sell their own content on YouTube. And uh, partners can actually work with advertisers to do things within the video, and that's, that's something that they can keep all on their own. So think about monetization as YouTube ads, plus things that you can do on your own if you're embedding uh, other types of things in your content. And then beyond that, the idea is once you're building this brand on YouTube, the YouTube ad revenue is just one tiny piece. Uh, we're seeing you know, a tremendous amount of uh, monetization for creators coming from uh, merchandising. Uh, we're seeing them go on concert tours. We're seeing them do book deals. Basically, they're building their brand. They're creating their own IP. And once you do that, you know, you have many different ways to exploit uh, that brand. And so the way we encourage people to think about it is think about YouTube as the foundation. The ad model is just basically the, the foundation and the one part of it. And once you build that brand, you have many, many other, other opportunities. I think it's, it's interesting. Uh, one of the things that we found last year, and, and sorry, over the last year, is that these kids are incredible. The channel partners, ki I call them kids because they're <laughs> usually 18 years old, but. You know, we saw Timothy Delegato this morning um, and Joseph Germani. They're, they're great at connecting the digital space, but it, 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 there's not that many of them, and it's starting to change, that are, that are uh, using kind of old school techniques to monetize. Um, I wonder if, you've, you know, if you have any examples of any of the creators who are starting to, you know, product placement deals, sponsorship, uh, concert tours, stuff like that. Do you get yeah. involved in those? Yeah, I mean, certain, certainly in the in the in the U.S. and Europe, we're definitely starting to see some of that. Um, there are a bunch of creators who actually got together and they formed this uh, group called Digitour, and literally, it's a bunch of YouTubers going market by market, and uh, they basically ask their fans, they're like, "Where do you want us to come?" And they start plotting their their path across across the U.S. Uh, we're also trying to figure out uh, many other ways to make it easier from a product perspective. To uh, to connect with some of those opportunities, whether it's concerts or making transactions uh, much easier, or uh, the other thing we're also seeing is uh, particularly the the young creators reaching out and doing their own uh, their own funding, right, or uh, Kickstarter campaigns or Indiegogo, and uh, we're, we're seeing them start to produce more ambitious productions, often with funding that comes from their fan base. So so we've talked a lot about creators. Um who, uh, um, you know, the, the younger end of creators, what about the big media companies? Are they, are they starting to get involved now? Uh, how, how's that looking for the future? Yeah, and I think, you know, the one thing I see certainly here in uh, Asia is that there's, there's no one single answer. Uh, it's market by market by market. Uh, and if you go back to, to India, uh, we have amazing partnerships there where we have Catch Up TV, we have partnerships with, uh, you know, the Bollywood producers and, uh, you know, the content that you see on YouTube there looks unlike many other markets. And in addition to that, you have, uh, you have more of your, uh, your local creators also coming up on the platform. Uh, Alex gave some examples as well this morning of the way many TV shows are really starting to engage with YouTube. Uh, they're finding ways to uh, throw contests out to their creators, uh, or sorry, to, to, their, to their fans and basically extend the conversation Actually, let me pull back to something Alex said this morning. I think it's worth repeating, is that, you know, with his late night show example, you know, competing over that one time slot is just not going to win in the future, because they're competing against people's time and uh, attention, and that time and attention is being consumed by social media and everything else that's going on, and so they have to figure out a way to extend that conversation, and YouTube's a great platform to extend that conversation. And uh, that can be done with, so we refer to it as shoulder content. So we've seen examples, example in Japan, uh, I think there's a show called Terrace House uh, that's, that's uh, on Fuji TV. What they also do is they produce a couple other shows around that that they put onto YouTube. And that way they keep the conversation going. And I think it's a very complimentary activity. And as Alex referenced this morning, the more, the, the more popular you are on YouTube, we also see the ratings go up on TV. So I think that's a big shift. In, in the past, people have worried about the cannibalization of what's happening on TV. And I think now we're really in a position where everybody's saying, OK, I have to actually participate in this new medium to, uh, to compete against everybody else and to make my show more popular. So friend or photo big media? Friend. <laughs> friend. I, I, I think you know, our, our big media relationships always, often start from, this, from the point of 
what's going on on YouTube? How do I protect my content on YouTube? And oftentimes there's this mentality of like, I need to block what's going on there to preserve you know, the IP that I have generated on TV. And over time, what we've done is be able to show like, let's, let's understand what's happening on YouTube. Let's think about whether you wanna block or you actually wanna embrace that activity. Because who's, who's uploading on YouTube? It's actually your fans. It's actually your biggest fans that are uploading on YouTube. And uh, so that dialogue has really changed. Certainly in the music industry, uh, generally in music, uh, we make as much money together with the music labels on the original content, the, the music videos, and then we make an equivalent amount on all the user-generated co uh, content that's uploaded with music in it. And so it's creating this whole new business opportunity and at the same time, it's really rewarding fans for wanting to share your content. So I think that that's the real innovation of YouTube from, from a story that started as like, let's worry about piracy, to a story that's now about embracing fan uploads and, uh, and, and embracing that passion. Um, let's talk about MCNs. Um, we had uh, Renee here from Maker this morning. Um, as ever, I never get to see our content until we put, <laughs> funny enough, we put it up on YouTube later on. Um, but uh, for, for anyone who, who didn't see the, the session this morning, basically, what is an MCN? What's a multi-channel network? How does it work? We, we, uh, we, we've used the notion of uh, the name multi-channel network to define generally companies that have started to work across many different channels. Uh, and, and providing services and, and, and working across them to create a, a broader network. So think of a TV channel and then think of, think of a show and then think of a, a ch TV network. It's kind of a, a parallel to that. Uh, but there's so many different types of companies that have emerged uh, in the YouTube ecosystem that the word MCN is a little bit, uh, a little bit tricky. But generally it means that, they're, that they're, they're a company that's working with a bunch of channels on YouTube. So Maker has uh, a lot of channels. I can't remember, hundreds, over 100,000 channels, I think. And uh, so that forms their network. And then what they do is that they're starting to do their own original programming and verticalized original programming on top of that. And as many of you probably know, Disney just acquired Maker uh, for uh, 500 million and with or now it's close to a billion dollar acquisition. And I think you know, what's interesting about that acquisition is that you know, Disney recognized through talks with Maker that YouTube actually is a different medium and one that they need to be involved in. It's one that certainly children and, and young kids are, are looking to, and they really didn't also have the expertise. And that's, that's one of the other key points is that, you know, working on YouTube requires an investment. It requires a different set of skills, and you can either invest in that in-house or what we're seeing in, in, in the US is we're starting to see a lot of acquisitions in the space for people to bring that DNA in-house. And one of the big opportunities for Maker and Disney is that Disney views Maker as a way to bring all of their existing IP to YouTube. And they think about YouTube as a different medium. There's TV, there's YouTube, they have merchandising, they have you know books, they have all different types of things and they say, okay, well, Star Wars, you know, why don't we have something going on with Star Wars? Why isn't there a continuous presence with Star Wars on YouTube? And so we'll have to see how that evolves, but I think it'll be an interesting example to watch to see how Disney embraces YouTube as a medium. It, it seems that everyone has an MCN. Um, I, I, you know, Alan Schwartz did an amazing job uh, emceeing for us today. He's the CEO of a very successful MCN in Japan called Breaker. Uh, is it, a, is it a gold rush? Is it, is it a land rush? I, I think in the beginning we saw a bunch of MCNs rushing to get to scale. Uh, so I think there, there are always going to be a set of pretty large uh, MCNs that are also trying to expand globally, makers trying to have a footprint in many different markets. We also see MCNs that really focus in a particular vertical. We see MCNs that focus on providing tools uh, and technology. So there's no one, 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 one single answer there, but we are starting to also see a lot of local MCNs pop up. We have MCNs now locally in India. We're seeing MCNs pop up in Japan. Uh, I'm not sure if we have any in, in Thailand yet, probably not since we just launched, but uh, we're starting to see that. And the way that we think about that is that it's really important for us to have a strong ecosystem of, of players that can provide services to, to our creators. 
Okay, so everyone go out, set up an MCN two years later. Well, if your if you're Awesomeness TV gets bought for 35 million after nine months or 11 months, Breaker, 945 million. So let's all set up a All That Matters MCN, uh, work with the Breaker MCN. Uh, an unfair question just as we finish. Uh, you, I know you're not allowed to have a favorite, but what are, the fav what are your favorite YouTube channels? Who, who do you enjoy watching the most? Oh, gosh. Uh, I mean, I think YouTube is clearly the place for, uh, for, for, for music. So just the wide variety of music. I'm, I'm constantly watching music, listening to music, watching music. Um, I love things like the TED Talks. Uh, I'm not sure if you, you're all familiar with TED Talks, but they're incredibly engaging, like 20 minutes, uh, really intellectual types of, types of talks. And then I just have a hankering for stupid, um, funny prankster type shows like College Humor. So, <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, please uh, go crazy. Vice President of Content for YouTube, Tom Pickett. Thank you.